Good morning. It's my happy opportunity to welcome all of you to the chapel. <clears throat> Some of you perhaps have been here. This is your first time to worship with us here at the Holy Beach Chapel. And if it is, we want to recognize you. Would you simply raise your hand so that we can give you a little sticker so that you can be identified so we can make sure that you feel welcome and that you feel like that you have come home. We're always glad to welcome not only those that are regulars, but also visitors. We're glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. <clears throat> and of course, uh, Holden Beach regulars, when you see the little yellow smiley face, um, make sure that uh, everyone knows that they're welcome to be here. By way of announcements, let me mention to you that the chapel ladies are once again, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's getting close to Thanksgiving again. And we are collecting, they are collecting food for food baskets for the needy during that time. Uh, the collection boxes will be out here in the vestibule. And what they need is on a little flyer. If you can pick it up on the table out there that gives you all the information. And you can always call the church office if you have questions. But that's always a, um, a chapel project. And it's always successful. And you will be blessed by your participation. Joe DeWeese was around uh, the chapel for many, many years. In many ways, his life was the chapel. And he gave it... Uh, um, unknown amount of time and effort, resources, and so he has passed away. His um, memorial service will be this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock here in the chapel. You are all invited to participate. Those of you that have been involved with the chapel for the last few years know Joe, and you know how much he loved this place and how much he loved you, and it would be a fitting tribute to be here. Also, they wanted me to remind you that after the worship service is over, there is some wonderful Oh, well, I know they're wonderful. I already had a couple of those cookies out here in, uh, in the vestibule for your uh, dining pleasure. Get a cup of coffee, chat with your friends, and if you have not made a friend yet, it'd be a great day to make one as you enjoy the refreshments here at the chapel. We are delighted that you're here. We hope you feel at home. And uh, just from a, a, a personal standpoint, thank you for all of the prayers you've offered in the loss of my brother-in-law. I appreciate it. And we have felt your prayers, and we are humbled by your uh, willingness to do that. Would you look in your bulletin now as we read responsibly our call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. May we pray together, please. Lord, you have proven your care for us again and again. You have spared us in times of grave danger, and you have comforted us in our times of suffering and in our sorrow. Today, we come to this place of worship with many needs. The whole range of human experience has affected us in one way or another. If we ever feel untouched, we know it's only for a moment. Life has borne down so hard upon some of us, and we are buffeted so badly that sometimes our faith wanes and we experience doubt. As the ancient psalmist asked you again and again, do you care if we perish? Is there no relief forthcoming? Are your hands tied by the laws that you have established? All of these questions, Lord, lurk in the inner shadows of our minds. Help us, Lord, to always be honest with you and to put our hard questions to you. But then we pray that you would give us patience to live with those questions, either until the answers come or until our chastened faith allows us to no longer demand an answer. For in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
How great our God's majestic name, hymn 400, excuse me, it's hymn 22. Let me get my glasses. That's hymn 22. May we stand and sing together. Apostles' Creed, now maybe we recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now in whatever way you are comfortable, greet those that are around you. Let them know you're glad they're here in God's house. Today is from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions? He has the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Could you bow your heads for a prayer, please? Dear God, we who inherit the earth, who admire the green leaves of summer turning to lustrous reds and yellows in the fall, who are exhilarated by the sun rising and the sun setting. We ask that we have the same heart, that we have compassion for one another, that we have respect for one another, and that we understand that though we have differences, 
We all want the same things, peace and love. We ask that you bless us and help nothing to divide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we now do the Lord's Prayer, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand again as we sing him 488. Come all Christians be committed. works as we bring our little gifts for your use and the work of your kingdom. We thank you that you have made us partners in your wonderful work. Amen.
I love to introduce people when they don't need an introduction. <laughs> Our guest speaker today is not really a guest of the chapel. John Simmons has all sorts of credentials <clears throat> as a pastor, former pastor, uh, working with uh, the uh, American Baptist Convention, working as a missionary on foreign soil. He brings a wealth of of experience and wisdom and abilities. He uh, has been the CEO, uh, CFO of um, the, uh, the convention there. So it's wonderful that he brings those and he, has, he and his wife, Lisa, have um, immersed themselves in the life of the chapel here, serving. If you had not guessed, he, sing, uh, he sings in the choir and um, also serves as the chairman of our stewardship committee. He and Lisa uh, teach a Sunday school class it's wonderful when people come in and immediately become a part and use their talents for the Lord's service here. John, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing, Allison? Good. I, you know, uh, several people asked me when they saw me with my suit on today if I was preaching. And I said, no, I'm singing in the choir. And someone said, are you singing a solo? I said, no, no. Uh, I, I think I'd rather preach. Um, someone else said, well, you're not on the schedule till the 31st. And I said, I know they changed it so you all would still come. <laughs> Actually, Reggie called me Monday morning, and the pastor that was scheduled to come had to take care of some other business, and so we swapped. Um, and no, I'm not related to the Simmons that's preaching next Sunday, so. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, if you hadn't noticed, this is Stewardship Month. And uh, someone said, now, do we have to hold on to our wallets when you preach? I said, no, they've taken the offering already. Um, but if you haven't noticed, let me explain. As the chairman of the Stewardship Committee, uh, I was privileged to work with Lois Wolf and uh, Reggie to develop our plan of communicating stewardship this month. And uh, if you got the email, had the letter in it that talked about stewardship and thanking you for your generous giving. Uh, there was also a, a stewardship moment in the newsletter that Sandy sent out to everyone. And in your bulletins each week, uh, Lois wrote these wonderful uh, articles to go in there that if you read each one, Separately, they have a good message, but if you put them all together, it summarizes what we want you to understand about Christian stewardship. And the plan was that on the 31st, I would preach a stewardship sermon. So guess what? I'm doing a stewardship sermon. <laughs> uh, but it, it's not really about money, is it? It's about our lives being given to God. So our text today is from Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse 23. And this is a context of a long narrative of Jesus that is recorded in Matthew's gospel, where he addresses uh, his beef with the Pharisees, teachers of the law, and leaders of the temple. Uh, this, what I will read today, is the fourth of the woes to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Uh, Jesus doesn't mince words here. He says, You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for your son, Jesus, that came and ministered amongst us. Thank you for his words today. Lord, as we look at your word, may we hear your voice, stir our hearts to understand your message that we would respond as you would want us to, and as you lead. Amen. Uh, last week, or the week before, on Victory Television, um, and that's some religious broadcast, I think, 
Um, one of the speakers, and I won't give his name, um, told the audience and all those that were watching on television that the reason Jesus had not returned was that his church was not giving enough money. <laughs> uh, here at Hope Meets Chapel, we uh, must want Jesus to come back quickly because we have been giving very generously. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, we have really been blessed even through the challenges of the pandemic and people not being able to worship in person and still others not being able to come yet because of health issues. You continue to give as the Lord lays on your heart and we are truly blessed uh, by your giving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's like, because of preachers like the one I mentioned, and hundreds of others like him, that the church often gets a reputation of being more concerned with people's money than their spiritual health. It's unfortunate that uh, most churches um, do stewardship around this time of the year, and it's about the time they're also doing budget. And so the two seem to be tied together. And so they talk about stewardship uh, and funding the budget. Um, when I was a pastor, uh, we tried to do stewardship education during the Lenten season, focusing on the walking to the cross and the resurrection, rather than doing budget time. Now, yeah, we did pledges and all that at budget time so that we could do the budget, but it wasn't about stewardship. It was about funding the ministries at that point. I, I think that uh, stewardship, uh, and that's an old word, it literally means caretaker. Uh, today, it would be a durable power of attorney if you wanted a technical term for it. And it is recognizing that everything we are and everything we have are gifts from God that have been entrusted to us by God to use as God desires. Durable power of attorneys. Taking and being responsible for someone else's assets and using them like they would want them used. Um, so it's really how we worship God with our lives, with our time, talent, and treasures. In fact, if you would go back and look at the words of the hymn we sang uh, right before the offertory, uh, it summarizes the sermon. Uh, how'd you know that? Uh, yeah. uh, seriously, it talks about giving of our time, giving of our service, and it goes through the words of pretty much it would summarize the sermon if you want to go back and look at that later. As uh, you know, Lisa and I were missionaries in Thailand, and we lived there four years, and we worked with a tribal group up in the northern mountains, um, and um, we had the privilege of going every harvest season, at the end of the season, the Lahu Christians would have uh, a rice festival, that's what they called it, and uh, these were big celebrations of the harvest coming in. Now, the people we worked with, most of them uh, were subsistence farmers. They lived in the mountains and they lived off the land. And so the harvest was really important to them. And so much like we celebrate Thanksgiving next month, they would gather to celebrate what God had pro produced and provided through the harvest. And um, it was a big deal. And villages would schedule their rice festivals so they could go and celebrate with each other all around the communities in the mountains there. And, um, you know, it, people would come in such numbers that the village would have to build a temporary place for the worship service and for the meal, of course. And, you know, they'd take and split the bamboo and make the benches. And if you've ever sat on a bamboo pole bench uh, for four hours, uh, you've experienced the love of God. Um, <laughs> and uh, then they had a stage built up and, you know, across the front of the stage, people would bring their gifts. Uh, and it was amazing to watch. It would be bags and bags and bags of new rice. Now, the rice that they would bring isn't uh, 
patty rice like you can get in the stores. This was mountain rice. This was mountain, grew on the side of the hill, depended only on the rain for its moisture. And so it had a different look, a different texture, and a much better taste. Mountain rice is so good. Um, and then they would make these things uh, called new rice cakes. And basically they'd pound the rice and make this goo and make a patty. And basically it's like eating Play-Doh, <laughs> except it got bigger the more you chewed it. Um, but then uh, they'd have an all-day worship service. And the choirs from the visiting villages would come and they would sing and present their choral offerings. And then they would have at least one sermon. And after the four-hour celebration, the highlight of the service was the dedication of the gifts that had been brought to support the ministry of the church. The people's tithes, they would celebrate and dedicate them to the Lord. It was always a good meal afterwards. They'd kill at least one pig and I don't know how many chickens. Um, and it was something that uh, after we got established there, uh, we had to attend at least a half a dozen of those every fall. Um, it was amazing to see the joy on the people's faces as they brought their offerings and laid them at the altar. And it was quite a sacrifice. I remember one village I went to, uh, and they'd given me a huge sack of rice. Uh, they had an emergency meeting of the elders of the village afterwards, and uh, I asked, you know, what's, what's going on? They said, well, the rice harvest isn't enough to feed everyone for the, till the next season. And so they're deciding what men will go into town or out of the country to work for the season to make enough money so the village can buy rice. We take food for granted. Uh, we take so much for granted. And yet, here these people are sharing out of what God has given them, their gifts, as an offering to God as thanksgiving for what God had provided for them. After my missionary service, I came back to West Virginia to serve as a minister of mission support and um, my job was to go out and educate people about mission giving and to meet with pastors and help them to get their churches on board with supporting missions. Um, and, you know, missions is the real reason the church exists. And so I was excited about doing this work. And I don't, I'll never forget, I went down on the southern part of West Virginia and I uh, was visiting this pastor, encouraging him to um, set the tithe of the church income as a benchmark for mission giving. And uh, I challenged him to set that benchmark, and he reared back and said, I don't believe in tithing. That's an Old Testament teaching, and I'm a New Testament preacher. Now, you can imagine my shock at him saying this. Um, I think his shock was probably greater when I responded I said, okay, that's what you think. Then I challenge you to do what Jesus said, and that's give it all. <laughs> he left ministry soon after that. I don't know where he went. <laughs> you see, giving a tithe, 10%, uh, is simply a way we recognize our knowing that God has given us everything we have. Uh, now, some churches and some church traditions seem to be so legalistic about the tithe. Uh, and I know I've talked about this with some of you, and, uh, and I believe that this legalism of the tithe, 10%, misses the point of giving as an act of worship. In this um, fourth of seven woes in Matthew, uh, Jesus calls out the Pharisees for being legalistic about the tithe while neglecting the weightier matters of the law. You see, the Pharisees had taken the law of the tithe to the extreme. Uh, if you go back and look at the rabbinical codes uh, 
and study the Torah, you will see that um, the tithe was only meant for the major crops and the animals, not these uh, uh, herbs they grew beside their houses to flavor their food. And Jesus said, you have gone to the extreme by tithing the dill, the mint, and the cumin, while neglecting the weightier matters or the more important matters of the law. And then Jesus goes on to name them. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And some translations use, translate the word there as faith. In Augsburger's commentary on Matthew, he defines justice as honest diligence in doing what is right. Honest diligence in doing what is right. Mercy, he says, is active kindness to everyone in need. And faithfulness is integrity in dealing with others. Now let's expand those a little bit. Let's think about the weightier matters of the law. Justice. Justice is not only doing what is right, but seeking what is right in society. Uh, defending the rights of the oppressed, standing up for those who are mistreated, doing right by all people. Do you please hear me. Every person on this planet is created in the image of God by God. And they were created for the same purpose as we. And that is to glorify God with their lives and worship God with their daily living. We need to stand up for those that are mistreated and do right by all peoples. No matter where they come from, no matter how they got here. Mercy is kindness in action. It's having compassion and care for everyone. I, it's helping the needy. And this is one of the many ways we show mercy here as a church. We look out for, the, do the backpacks and do many things to help those in need around us. And that's an important part of mercy. Mercy is also uh, something each of us wants, but we find it hard to give to others. You know, when we do wrong, we want mercy. We go to God, we ask forgiveness, we want mercy. Uh, we get caught pull over by the cop, we want mercy. We don't want that ticket. We'll take a warning, but we don't, you know, we don't want the ticket. We want mercy. But when someone does us wrong, and Reggie talked about this Wednesday night, um, we have a hard time forgiving and showing mercy to them. Faithfulness is reflected in how we deal with others. The temple leaders had loophole after loophole to work the system to their advantage and take advantage of others. Um, I mean, if you read the woes there, you'll see that uh, one of the loopholes they had was if you, let's say, if you swore by the altar, that oath meant nothing. But if you swore by the gift on the altar, well, then it was binding. If you swore by the temple, it meant nothing. But if you swore by the gold on the temple, then it was binding. See the loopholes that they're making to take advantage of people. And Jesus tells them, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Any idea what that means? <laughs> uh, you ever get one of those no seams caught in your throat? <laughs> and, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you want that out of there. And most of the time, it's just simpler to drink water and get, get it down. Uh, and he says that you swallow a camel. Now, a camel is a pretty big thing. No, it wasn't big. It was unclean. And so what Jesus is saying is you are focused on the minutia, and you're missing the big picture. Uh, I, you know, happened this morning... As we was getting ready to turn in to come to church, and there's a bunch of boys, fishing pole, one of them, and the other one had his cell phone, and he's walking 
down the sidewalk and um, almost stepped in a puddle and so focused on what was going on on his phone, he almost just walked out in front of us. Now, fortunately, we were watching, but he was so focused on the minutia that he didn't see the big picture. Uh, we went to Charleston, South Carolina this week for a couple of days, and sure enough, people walking through the city market on their phones and not paying a bit of attention where they're going. Isn't that the way we get sometimes? Uh, we get so caught up in being legalistic and following you know, what we think are the rules that we miss the bigger picture. Um, in our first reading, you heard what God desires, and that is for us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. That's pretty much what Jesus is saying here. There are many times in scriptures that, uh, and we've heard the sermon on this many times, uh, where we hear that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment on, he added, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength is really what stewardship is about. This is the depth of stewardship that we give God ourselves and all these other things will be taken care of. The depth of stewardship, loving God with all we are and all we have. This, my friends, is what God desires. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given to us. We thank you for sending your Son as our Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, in this time of prayer, stir our hearts that we might hear your voice and understand how to respond to this word from you today. Amen. Now we'll stand and we'll sing 660. O Master, let me walk with thee. Thank you.
you're not even